An explosion took place in North Korea along the Chinese border, killing at least 15 people. A typhoon has hit Shanghai, China, and is causing floods in some parts of the city. And also, the Chinese regime has completed its Beidou satellite navigation system, which it will use to challenge the US GPS network. Welcome back, everyone. First off, some breaking news. An explosion on August 3rd in a North Korean town bordering China has killed at least 15 people. The explosion took place in Ryanggang-do of Haesan City in North Korea around 6.10 a.m. North Korean newspaper Daily NK quoted a source stating the explosion appeared to be from a gas leak from a home's liquid gasoline tank and said the fire spread to dozens of nearby houses. Now the source said the fire caused by the gas explosion burned residential homes for about an hour and the entire multi-family community was completely scorched in the explosion. Of course, given the restrictive nature of reporting in North Korea, the true cause and scale of the explosion is still unknown. In Harbin City in China's Heilongjiang province, meanwhile, a food warehouse collapsed, killing nine people who were inside. The warehouse was from Harbin Yushou Food. The previous tenant of the building, a manager from Fengjiang Automobile Glass, told Chinese media that he knew the building was in poor shape and also risked collapse. He said that was why he decided to move out a month ago. Meanwhile, heavy rains are continuing to hit many parts of China on August 5th, including in southeastern Gansu, central and southern Shanxi, eastern Henan, and central and western Shandong. Floodwaters peaked again at the upper reaches of the Yellow River, and some areas around it have been temporarily closed. Now, amid these rains in Xinjiang and Henan, a sudden rainstorm collapsed a wall outside the local health committee and a commercial bank and all 16 vehicles that were parked outside were destroyed. And one of the two typhoons now hitting China has reached Shanghai, where heavy rains have disrupted traffic and led to pooling of water of up to nearly four feet deep. Winds were estimated at around 85 miles per hour at the typhoon's epicenter. More than 600 flights in Shanghai were disrupted, and travel by train, ferry, and bus has also been disrupted. And meanwhile, some updates on the novel coronavirus, the CCP virus. The Epoch Times has received two leaked documents and virus cases in Dalian and some of the efforts of the local regime there. Now, the first of these is a map showing the spread of the epidemic, and the other is an investigative report, several investigative reports, on the asymptomatic carriers. Now, the documents show that Chinese authorities are aware of the situation of the virus in Dalian and have also been clearly mapping it out. It also shows there are many secret outbreak spots that authorities have not made public. It also reveals there are a large number of asymptomatic carriers in Dalian, and the epidemiology investigative reports on each of the asymptomatic carriers recorded their whereabouts. It also shows where they may have contracted the virus and the areas they potentially contaminated. Now, on August 4th, Dalian officials announced at a press conference there were 89 confirmed cases in Dalian and 26 asymptomatic infections. But as the Chinese Communist Party always alters and downplays the numbers, the actual confirmed cases in China may far exceed the official announcements. Now, when it comes to this, it's not just top-level officials, say, hiding information from the public and the international community. Part of that is to protect the image of the CCP and also give the illusion to the Chinese people that the Communist Party is handling the situation better than they're claiming. And at the same time, also low-level officials have an incentive to not alert top-level officials of virus outbreaks because they can be punished for it. If an official, say, in their local area has virus cases and they report it, that local official faces punishment. And so it's in their incentive to, say, conceal the actual numbers. And so what you have in many different cases is that local officials, they may have their internal reporting on what is actually taking place, but when they report it to top-level officials or to the next level up, they will reduce the numbers or conceal information. Now, since July 22nd, the epidemic has spread from Dalian to other parts in China, including Changchun Province, Jilin, Fujian, and even parts of Beijing. And now for the broader stories for today. First off, there was fairly broad reporting that the CCP is accusing the United States of, quote, monitoring, harassing, and willfully detaining Chinese students and researchers. Now, the claim has been parroted by even some of the bigger legacy news outlets, which are trying to tie it to, say, racial discrimination and issues like this. But like many issues of this kind, what's missing is the context. 
The United States is currently investigating CCP spy operations in the United States, which include the CCP's numerous programs that openly use students and academics for economic theft and espionage. Now, a few of these, for example, the CSSAs, the Chinese Student and Scholar Associations, in their own doctrines, on their own websites, and active at most universities in the United States, they say that they are funded and directed by the Chinese consulates. The Chinese consulate openly runs a lot of these programs. And these Chinese student groups are not normal Chinese students. They're organizations that monitor other Chinese students at U.S. universities. If Chinese students, for example, join a pro-democracy event or an event supporting human rights in China, the CSSA can report them to the consulate, and their families back in China can also be threatened for that. There are many cases of this happening. Also, the CSSAs are a way for the Chinese Communist Party to not only influence the schools themselves, such as by staging, say, protests, if there's an event that the CCP does not approve of, but also it can grow different agents from within the CSSAs. The Chinese Communist Party, again, openly finances and directs the CSSAs. These are Chinese student groups, adding again some context to why the U.S. government might be going after Chinese students. There's also the Thousand Talents program we hear so much about, such as with this Dr. Charles Lieber, the former head of the chemistry department at Harvard, who is being charged with being part of that program. And also many different programs like it. For example, Torch program, 973 program, 211 program. Different technical names, basically the same basic idea. The Chinese Communist Party has directives, not only of having people return to China, for example, stealing IP or intellectual property and going back to China for the benefit of the CCP there, but also what they call, quote, serving in place, where the individuals through these programs advance the CCP's agendas on U.S. soil, and many academics are part of that. And again, the reason why the Chinese Communist Party uses students and academics in its spy programs are many. It's, for example, the research programs that are done at U.S. universities or through grants to different research facilities through the universities. It's to, for example, academics who might be doing media interviews with some of the big media. They can support the CCP's agendas and statements to the press, and these are cited as experts on China. It can, for example, be the CSSAs or the Chinese Communist Party using students to grow them to, say, eventually get into different roles such as U.S. government jobs or security jobs that might serve the interests of the CCP. There are many different uses of this, and the Chinese Communist Party has been very aggressive in its programs to advance these things. And now we do see the U.S. government targeting these groups, both Chinese students and academics. For example, through the Department of Education's current investigations into Chinese spy programs at universities. Meanwhile, U.S. officials are taking additional steps to push back against the CCP for its theft of intellectual property. Republican Senator Chuck Grassley and Democrat Senator Sheldon Whitehouse have introduced legislation that would make it so that if a foreign national is engaged in stealing intellectual property or other sensitive information from the United States, they would be unable to travel to the U.S. and could be deported if they're already on U.S. soil. Now, Senator Whitehouse said this in a press release, quote, attempts to hack a COVID-19 vaccine, again, the CCP virus, quote, show just how high the stakes are when it comes to safeguarding America's intellectual property. Foreign nationals engaged in trade secret theft and economic espionage must be held accountable, and more needs to be done to stop researchers working on American soil while in league with our adversaries. Again, tying back into what we just discussed about the CCP's use of academia, American academics who they might get in their pockets for these programs. Now, there's even broader pushback against the CCP for intellectual property theft, and this is no longer a partisan issue. Here again, we have a bipartisan move to put an end, in some regards, to Chinese intellectual property theft. And so what are we seeing here? We're seeing that this issue with the Chinese Communist Party's unconventional warfare systems, which do include economic warfare, which IP theft would fall under, it is no longer considered a partisan issue. And here, for example, as well, we have two U.S. senators, one a Republican, one a Democrat, coming together to go against the Chinese Communist Party's use of individuals when it comes to intellectual property theft and targeting, if they do engage in IP theft, their ability to stay in the United States. In other news, the Chinese Communist Party finished launching its challenge to the U.S. GPS system with its own replacement known as Beidou. Now, the CCP recently launched its last satellite to bring this global positioning system into full operation. 
and it's already raising concerns over security. An industry publication inside GNS has reported this quote, as a two-way rather than a one-way communication system, Beidou differs in two aspects from other GNSS or Global Navigation Satellite Systems. Beidou can identify the locations of receivers on the Earth's surface, and Beidou-compatible devices can transmit data back to the satellites in text messages of up to 1,200 Chinese characters. Now, it states the two-way communication system can track people by their cell phones and can also be used in cyber attacks. It also cites a 2017 U.S. government report which states this, quote, Beidou could pose a security risk by allowing China's government to track users of the system by deploying malware transmitted through either its navigation signal or messaging function via a satellite communication channel once the technology is in widespread use. Now, this also raises additional concerns when it comes to military conflict. Many modern navigation targeting systems use GPS, and the United States offers global access relatively to the GPS network. If China or another hostile nation were to start a war against America, however, or one of its allies, they could be cut off from the network, which could disable crucial military systems of those countries. Now that the CCP has a GPS replacement, however, which it's also providing to U.S. adversaries, it has created a workaround to this issue. And as the CCP moves forward with its One Belt, One Road initiative to get countries into debt traps and to export its China model system of government, Beidou is part of its technological package when it goes to these countries. So again, what are we seeing here? Beidou is different from GPS in a few different ways, not only because it's under the control of the Chinese Communist Party, but because it can actually track individual users. It not only lets you say, for example, see where you're located, it is a way for the CCP to monitor where you are located. And it can also send messages to your phone and also transmits data from your phone or from your device back to the CCP up to, again, 1,200 Chinese characters. And there's a few additional points to this Beidou navigation system. The Chinese Communist Party found an interesting way of selling it to the world, which is Beidou also uses GPS. It still siphons information from, for example, the U.S. system. It works in sync with the U.S. system. But if the Chinese Communist Party were ever cut off from GPS, it could easily separate itself from that. And so when it goes and sells this product or pushes it to other countries, it not only has all the different features that the CCP has put into it, but it also has all the features of GPS because it uses GPS still. And in other news, as the CCP expands its territorial disputes in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and along the Indian border, it is also taking steps to gain ground in the Arctic where the United States is also now expanding its presence. Now, in mid-July, the CCP sent an expedition team of scientists to the Arctic on its first domestically built polar icebreaker, which left from Shanghai. Now, this follows the recent completion in April of another expedition into the Arctic under the CCP. And this is in addition to its expeditions also in the area when it comes to maritime trade and security, also again focused on that region. This is raising concerns it could expand its territorial claims much in the same way it has in the South China Sea. In 2018, the CCP declared itself a near-Arctic state and created a plan for a, quote, polar silk road. Now, the United States is aware of this threat from the CCP. President Donald Trump issued a memo on safeguarding U.S. interests in the Arctic and Antarctica. He wrote that to help protect U.S. national interests in these regions, and to keep a strong security presence alongside U.S. allies. Quote, The United States requires a ready, capable, and available fleet of polar security icebreakers that is operationally tested and fully deployable by fiscal year 2029. The memo gives directives to evaluate security in the regions and to begin creating a fleet of icebreakers for the United States. Now, when it comes to the Arctic, the Arctic is viewed as the, quote, ultimate high ground and it has serious security implications for the United States and other countries. This is especially, for example, if China or Russia, and Russia is also heavily engaged there, were to construct military or ballistic missile bases. So, for example, if Russia or China wanted to launch a nuclear attack on the United States in, say, this doomsday scenario, which hopefully we'll never see, if they had a base in the Arctic, they could more easily and more directly launch it from there against the U.S., this would mean less time for the U.S. to respond. It also means less time, for example, they want to launch other forms of attacks 
for example, bombing runs or, for example, invasion. If they had bases just in the Arctic, this is a direct threat to the United States, and because, again, it's right above the United States, it's regarded as the ultimate high ground when it comes to security. Now, in Canada, meanwhile, authorities have declared the requirements to extradite Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou to the United States have now been met. Now, the formal hearing on or handover to U.S. authorities is set for April 2021. And as this happens, the two Canadian nationals detained in China on spy charges and arrests that were viewed as a retaliation for Meng Wanzhou's arrest, they're now nearing 603 days in Chinese custody, and they're still facing the death penalty. And the CCP has previously suggested that it would consider a prisoner exchange for Meng. Again, very much like a hostage exchange in this regard. Now, we can expect harsh retaliation from the Chinese Communist Party against Canada when it comes to handing over Meng to U.S. authorities. The CCP has threatened Canada on many fronts when it comes to this. And again, Canada is stuck in kind of a catch-22. If it agrees to side with the CCP and avoid the U.S. extradition of Meng, it risks a break in U.S.-Canadian relations. If the Canadian government, on the other hand, sides with the U.S. as it does appear to be doing so now, it risks a major break from the Chinese Communist Party. And again, Canada is stuck in catch-22. And in Germany, meanwhile, the country is taking a stronger stance against the Chinese Communist Party as well. And this is as the EU is discussing creating a unified stance against China. Now, Michael Roth, the Secretary for Europe and Germany's Foreign Affairs Ministry, stated in Germany's Der Spiegel newspaper that the CCP is a, quote, ever more powerful snake. And that also he said the EU must meet head on against the CCP. He also wrote, quote, we must not be afraid to lock horns when it comes to difficult issues such as human rights, security, and technology. This, too, is about our own sovereignty at the end of the day. And as this takes place, Germany has suspended its extradition pact with Hong Kong and will close the CCP's Confucius Institutes that are still active in the country by the end of 2020. Now, so why is this a big deal? It's because with Germany goes the European Union. If Germany takes a strong stance against the CCP, this is also seen as the head of the EU taking that stance against the CCP. With Germany will go the EU. And the European Union, again, is talking about unifying in its policies against the CCP. And in addition to this, Germany also has large influence over liberal governments in the United States and in other countries. Its stance against the CCP doesn't carry the same image of partisanship that U.S. politics does. And so if Germany takes a stand against the CCP, this also sends a message to liberal governments around the world that they can also get behind it on that same stance. And so in other words, we're now seeing this becoming a bipartisan issue globally, both when it comes to conservative governments and when it comes to liberal governments. We have Germany and the EU standing up against the CCP, the United States standing up against the CCP, Australia, India, many other countries as well. And so again, this is no longer seen as a partisan issue when it comes to either liberal or conservative parties in different countries. And also more countries are uniting against the CCP. For example, the EU, for example, this new Quad Alliance, and when it comes to others as well. Also, I had the pleasure of interviewing Bill Gertz recently on the new Cold War between the United States and China. Now, Bill is a national security correspondent with the Washington Times and is the author of Deceiving the Sky, Inside Communist China's Drive for Global Supremacy. Let's jump into that now. Hey, Bill Gertz, great having you on Crossroads. Great to be here. Now, I know you've been on this beat for quite a long time and talking about a lot of issues for also for a very long time that are just now starting to hit the headlines. Now, one of the big buzzwords right now in a lot of the big media is they're talking about this new Cold War with China. If someone were to tell you you know, we're now in a Cold War with China. How would you respond to that? Well, uh, as I've advocated many times, uh, China has been at war, low level war against the United States for many years. Uh, but it, only one side has been fighting in this Cold War, and that's China. Uh, under the Trump administration, they've begun to fight back. And I think we're starting to see that play out. I think the turning point was really 2017 when the Trump administration announced the new national security strategy, which for the first time in decades recognized China as a strategic competitor. Uh, my view is that that's, that's not far enough, that we really need to identify China as an adversary. And once we do that, we can start developing policies that will better protect the country and the American people from 
this uh, Cold War from China. Now, in your book, Deceiving the Sky, you talk about two main areas where the Chinese Communist Party has waged really an unconventional war, in their own words, against the United States when it comes to military development and economic warfare. Could you explain this, this a bit in terms of how they're doing this? Well, the Chinese strategy going back to the 70s was cast by Deng Xiaoping, who said, bide our time, build our capabilities. So China was really using deception to play down what I call the China threat, which is a play on what Beijing calls the China threat theory. It's something that uh, diplomats and intelligence personnel are tasked to monitor around the world to see how it will affect uh, the ability of Beijing to modernize. Um, really, I think that now we're starting to see China shift dramatically. Under Xi Jinping, we've seen the so-called China dream, which is really a Chinese nightmare of expansionism. And we're seeing that mostly on the economic front. And again, it's, it, it contains elements of this idea of, of deception, not really showing what they're after. But China is clearly trying to move towards global supremacy in an economic way. And they're doing that through a number of uh, forums. Uh, one is the Belt and Road Initiative. Other is intelligence activities to steal technology and co-opt uh, foreign officials. Now, when it, when it comes to the agendas of the Chinese Communist Party, now they talk about China 2025, they talk about the, the China model and exporting it through, as you mentioned, the One Belt, One Road Initiative. How, and, and also, you know, global hegemony and these types of things. How would you describe what the real agenda of the Chinese Communist Party is and how does that relate to how they view the United States? First off, for, for many years, I remember doing a debate probably 15 years ago in New York City uh, on whether China was a threat. And I met a businessman there who said, told me, an American businessman who said, I've been doing business in China for 20 years and I've never met a communist. Um, so Ch China has truly deceived the world into understanding the nature of its system. And this is something that I really focus on in Deceiving the Sky. Without fully understanding the type of Marxist-Leninist system that is in Beijing, we can't really understand what motivates uh, China to do the Belt and Road Initiative, to steal technology. Uh, they are a Marxist-Leninist state, and as part of that, they see uh, all of the world's evils being led by the capitalist United States. So it's not just simply a, a, a simple matter for Beijing to want to modernize and develop. It's, it's doing so in order to destroy, ultimately to destroy the United States, which is the greatest impediment for achieving this notion of Xi Jinping's China dream, which is to have China back, uh, communist China, back as its rightful place as the world leader and, and dominate uh, through, through hegemony. Now we have an extended version of this interview available on Patreon for our supporters there. So please join us on Patreon if you haven't already. Now with that said folks, we're again broadcasting five days a week, Monday through Friday. Now also if you want to support us, please join our Patreon. The link is in the description below. If you haven't already, please also don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps this channel grow. And if you want to go the extra mile, please tell a friend or family member about Crossroads. Now with that said, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free. Mm -hmm.